Well, good morning to all of you. Uh, I have been going through on Sunday mornings a series uh, called the Spiritual Biography of a Nation. And I am starting, I'm not stopping that, I'm just taking a pause for a season to start another series. I know that sounds funny, but I'd like to come back to that series in the future. But I've been going through the history of our country, but not so that I can just teach history, but so that I can illuminate how God builds a nation, because it's the same way he builds an individual. And so if you get a chance to go through that, it's extremely powerful. And we were right at the, uh, the pilgrims uh, arriving in, uh, in this new world uh, right when I stopped. So, and that was 14 sessions in. So there's a lot of depth in that uh, so far. But I would like to switch things up and throw a curveball at all of us uh, and do something that I think uh, is going to be very, very special for this fall. And uh, it's a series that I'm calling The Shadow Nation Rises. I even sort of like the name too. But it's The Shadow Nation Rises and this first one is called The Shadow Scriptures. There is a, there is a, a beauty and a marvel when you approach the scriptures to recognize that you could be reading the histories of Israel, but that those very histories are actually useful to you to train you in how you are to live in your body in the year 2020. You see, it's a shadow of something to come. It is a foreshadow, if you, if you understand the, the terminology in, in a story development or in a movie, you're going to say this is a hint at something to happen. And so what you're going to say, I'm going to be going through the book of Deuteronomy, and in a sense, you're going to see the formation of this shadow kingdom, that God is going to build a kingdom that is going to reveal what we live in today. And so as you study, you begin to recognize this is actually training us, this is foreshadowing for us how we are to engage with our spiritual enemies today. You have a nation in the book of Deuteronomy it's going to be right before the Israelites are going to cross the Jordan into this place called the land of Canaan or the land of promise. And it is like a speech or as some would say a series of speeches from Moses a month before they are going to cross over, setting a pattern in place for what they should expect and how they should live once they conquer their enemies. It's not if they conquer their enemies, when they conquer their enemies, because God is going to go before them. So it's a foregone conclusion that they're going to take the land, but when they take the land, this is how they take the land, and this is how they keep the land. So, oh boy, there's a whole bunch of good stuff in here. But what we see is it's a shadow nation. It is a nation that is prophetic in its very nature. It's telling of something to come. And so when you study it, you recognize that's just not Israel. That's not just for Israel. It's actually to show Jesus. And it's not just to show Jesus. It's to show Jesus' bride and their relationship together because we are the kingdom of God in the year 2020. So that's just to give you a little uh, preparatory uh, foundational understanding of where we're going. But the shadow of scriptures. So uh, I don't know why it does that. You know, I don't know if it bothers you to see the why of Deuteronomy on the next line, uh, but you know, it does sort of affect me. Uh, this is the very first words of the book of Deuteronomy. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness in the plain opposite Suf, between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dizahab. So, the reason I'm, I'm giving you that is because to the Hebrew, the name of this book is not Deuteronomy. The name of this book is These Are the Words. And so now you know where it comes from. These are the words. So where did the name Deuteronomy come from? Well, technically that's from a translation from the Hebrew into the Latin. It was Latin Vulgate, which was attempting to sort of take the meaning of what was happening here because this is a rehearsal of what Moses has already said. Almost everything that is about to be said is a rehearsal of the histories, a rehearsal of the law of God. Everything that is before them, it's a remembrance. 
So as a result, they're going to use this idea of a repeat or a second version of something. So deutero actually means second and nomo, law. So deuteronomic uh, would be like the second law. And so, which can be confusing to people if you actually study this, like, is this a second law? No, this is a repeat of the law. It's like a second rehearsal. It's a second speaking of it. It's not a second law. But what's interesting, even though some people will complain about this and say, that's a terrible name for this book. That name doesn't work. So you get all these scholars that are upset over the fact that these you know, people with the Latin Vulgate are going to say it incorrectly. I would say, stop. I really like the name. I think it's very intriguing because what it's doing is it's showing a picture of a second. And so just follow me on this, because if you hang out here, which some of you are now stuck here for five weeks with me, you're going to hear me say this a lot. There are always two. Because when you're understanding the global terrain of Scripture, you need to recognize that even the book itself, the Bible, 66 books, is divided into two parts. There's always two. And so wherever you turn, it's like, well, there's two. And those twos are very, very important. The first is very symbolic too. The first cannot save. The second is where the salvation is. And so you're going to see, even in the breaking of the Bible up into two, you have the Old Testament and you have the New Testament. The Old Testament is going to show you that you need a Savior. The New Testament is going to introduce you to the Savior that can save you. And so as a result, you're going to see this dynamic all throughout the Bible. And so we have a book called The Second Law. Okay, that's actually what it means, as strange as of a title as that is. But I like it, and I'm going to leverage that uh, today as we talk. So Deuteronomy, the second version of a thing. So I'm going to give you some different syn synonym types of uh, phrases the second version of a thing, the same as the first, but totally different. Isn't that funny? Moses is going to give the same. He's saying the same, but it's totally different. A new beginning. That's what Deuteronomy is. If you, if you look at the other books, you're going all the way back to, you know, the crossing of the Red Sea, and now you're, you know, at Mount Sinai, you're receiving the Ten Commandments, and now you're going to hang out in the wilderness because of your rebellion and your unbelief, you're stuck here to rot, right? Well, this is a new beginning. It's a new generation. You know that all that previous generation has passed away now? We have, get this, a second generation. And that's who this is written to. This is written to a second people. So a, second, a new beginning, a second generation, a second leader. Moses is passing something on, but guess what? He's going to end here, and he is going to pass the torch of leadership to a second leader. In fact, the very end of this book is the commissioning of that second leader. So, all throughout the Bible, you're going to see the first and the seconds. Law, grace, flesh, spirit, Adam, Jesus. You're going to see a second emerge. And just you know, as a fascinating tidbit, the, the name Joshua and the name Jesus are the same. And so you're going to see this passing of the torch to the second who happens to be named, of all things, Jesus. <laughs> that is actually the picture that we see. So a second leader, a second understanding. By the way, for any of you arriving late, uh, there are some juicy seats right down here in the splash zone. Do you guys know that this is called the splash zone? Uh, if you've ever been to SeaWorld, there's you know, the dolphins jump and then the things splash. Well, that can happen here too. <laughs> so firsts. To understand a first, like when we, we see the old covenant, that's a first covenant, okay? And so when you understand firsts in Scripture, this will help you understand it and chew on it a little. That which is familiar. This is what's known to us. So... You must be born again. Unless you are a second, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So in your first state, everything's familiar. This is what you're used to. This is the family you grew up with. This is the way you've always thought. This is the way you've always lived. This is the way you've always handled and approached that situation. It is that which is familiar. The key to Christianity is you must relinquish that which is familiar 
to enter into a second way of living. That which was. That which points to that which has now come. That which ought not to be returned to, unto. That which once had authority but no more. That which is elder but a servant to the younger. There's a whole bunch of depth in that, guys. I'm not going to go into that at a great deal, but there's a lot of things that when we, you look at any one of those, and even for those of you that are going to be present this week in our one-week intensive training, you're going to see, if we, if we return to that screen later in the week, you're like, whoa, that's incredible. There is so much depth just in that one description of firsts. Genesis 25, 23. And the Lord said to her, so context, Rebecca is pregnant. And so this is uh, Isaac's wife, and uh, she was barren, and so he prays over her, and she conceives. Now she's pregnant, and there's a lot going on in her womb, and she cannot figure out. It's probably one of those things where she's rolling around at night going, I cannot sleep because I seem to have some kind of war taking place inside of me. And that's actually what is happening. So she prays and asks God, why am I this way? What's going on? And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So at first blush, you're going to see that and go, who cares? You know, you're going to find out that, yeah, it's Esau and Jacob right, who will later be called Israel. The firstborn comes out hairy all over. The second one, his name is Jacob, heel grabbing. He's grabbing Esau's heel on the way out. It's interesting because these two are going to be a picture of two nations. The descendants of Esau is a country called, well, he has a grandson named Amalek, the Amalekites. It's called the first nation. The second one is going to be Israel. And so it's the second nation. The second nation is the one that God will reveal his Messiah through. And so God is going to always choose the second. You ever felt bad for the first? It's like, why is he choosing the second? You go all the way back to Cain and Abel, and they offer their offerings. Cain offers, I mean, what he offers isn't that bad, right? I mean, come on, what's, what's wrong with his little stash uh, that he's giving there. I mean, he worked hard for that. And yet God is going to not receive Cain's offering. He is going to choose Abel's offering. He is going to be pleased by the second offering. That is a foreshadow, guys, right there, baked into Scripture. It's not the offering of the flesh. It's not the offering of a, our good works unto God to try and keep the law that is ever going to please God. It is the offering of the second, the Son of God. That's the one. It's the second offering that will please our God. It's a shadow of something to come. So what we see here is that two will be separated, just like in you. Did you know that there are two at war within you? It's called flesh and spirit. And so even as you hear the truth, you'll notice that you'll sometimes argue with it. You know it's true, but you'll sort of fight because it's asking you to deny yourself. It's asking you to give up your life. And you want to hold on to your life. You're like, well, why, why am I like this? Just like Rebecca. And God's going to say, you want to know why? Because there's two at war within you. But I want you to know that one people shall be stronger than the other. And that the older, or the first, will serve the second. The Spirit is greater than the flesh. And if you will yield to the Holy Spirit, you will actually find that it will become stronger in your life. I remember there's a, a, a Native American, I don't know, tale, proverb, I'm not exactly sure what to call it. It's this uh, old uh, Native American Indian guy that's smoking his peace pipe. At least that's what I picture him doing. You know, and he's puffing out big, you know, little uh, circles. Uh, and so then uh, he has uh, a wolf uh, well, I'll put the, the wolf and then a, a big, like, Great Dane type of dog, huge dog, on, on both sides of him. And someone comes up and sees the two dogs, admires them, and says, so when they fight, which one wins? And the wise chief puffs a few more smoke rings and then says, <clears throat> the one I feed. Well, it's about like that. Whichever one you feed is going to define the winner in the battle. If you feed the flesh, if you feed the wolf in your life, well, 
he'll be superior. But if you starve the wolf and you feed the Great Dane, I'm not exactly sure what dog this should be, but if you feed the, the, the other one, well, that will be superior. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 47. The first man, Adam, you got a first there, guys, became a living being. The last Adam, which in, very, in, in this very same context is going to be referred to as the second man, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. So the natural is always first. It's the earthy. And afterward, the spiritual. The spiritual is second. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Now, there's been 77 generations, and he's calling him the second man. There's a lot of men. You read the genealogy of Jesus, there's a lot of men in there. And yet, Paul is going to refer to Jesus as the second man. Isn't that interesting? First, second. The whole entire Old Testament is the generations of Adam. That's what it says. These are the generations of Adam. You know how the New Testament starts? These are the generations of Jesus Christ. You have two it's going to separate. At the life of Christ, you're going to see a new beginning. You're going to see a crossing of a Jordan. You're going to see something new begin. Deuteronomy. So it's the shadow second. It's a picture of the second at work. Another name for it, the shadow pattern. So when I, if I were to say to you that you could actually study Deuteronomy and actually understand how you are to take the land of promise in your own life. God has given you exceeding great and precious promises, but how are you to take those? How are you to go after them? Well, you might want to take a peek at Deuteronomy. Isn't that strange? Why would it be in Deuteronomy? What a strange way place to find that. And yet it's a shadow pattern. It is a pattern, but it's a shadow version of it. To hint and to foreshadow that which is to come. The kingdom of heaven come to this earth in us Here's another name, the shadow kingdom. So it is a kingdom that is being established and we're seeing a shadow of it. It's a real kingdom in an earthly sense. However, it's a shadow and a picture of a greater kingdom that is to come. So the Deuteronomic shadows. So in this book, you're going to see the second man. You're going to see Joshua being raised up and Moses is going to say, be strong and of good courage. He's going to give the exhortation to the second man to go in and take the land, to lead the people into battle. Moses is symbolic of a first. He's the law. The law can't take you into the land of promise. You cannot gain the fullness of God by following the law. You, you gain the fullness of God by following the second and so you're going to see that come out in this book. It's the second man. It's the second generation. Your first life cannot please God. It's the second life. It's the second generation of you that can actually take the land. The second territory. We oftentimes live in this doldrum state of the wilderness in our life where we esteem God and we're trying to please God out of our own self-efforts, but God wants to take us across that Jordan under the power of Christ's leadership into a new territory of living, one that flows with milk and honey. Now, I know some of us are like, I don't even like milk and honey. That's supposed to be a compliment of how wonderful this land is, though, so just know that. The second baptism. So in the first, you have two baptisms in this story. It's really interesting. You have the Red Sea, which is a passing through water, and then you have the Jordan. And so which one are we emphasizing in Deuteronomy? They're going to cross the Jordan River. Okay, so you look at the ministry of Jesus Christ. He's going to be baptized in the Jordan. He's going to go to the far side of the Jordan, to the wilderness, be tested for 40. And then he's going to return in the power of the Spirit. You're going to see this parallel that is being created in the life of Christ and in his ministry. And then you have the second law, which is actually the name of the book. But what we're going to see is it's a foreshadow. You know that in... Romans 7, you're going to see Paul actually reference a second law. And it's a law that is higher than the first. And this is going to foreshadow it. It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 15 says, The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. 
As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So though you have looked like Adam for a good season of your life, what God's intent is for you is to convert you, is to change you, is to transform you, so that you are set free from living Adam's pattern. And you can now live Christ's pattern. So some first men. These are just some examples because, by the way, this could be the whole teaching. is just going through the Old Testament and showing you firsts and then showing you seconds. This is just a taste. Adam is a first. Cain is a first. Ishmael. You know, there was Ishmael. Uh, he was a firstborn son. And then you have Esau, firstborn. Saul, first king. Amalek, first nation. Haman, uh, we'll get into that. I mean, this is, that's quite the list of bad guys right there, okay? If you look at that list, you're like, boo, and yet they're firsts. It's not an accident, okay? I remember I was, uh, Le Leslie was pregnant with Hudson, and we were over at someone's house, and that, this little girl, she was so cute, and she said, uh, I have a I have a name for your, your little baby. And I go, oh, good, because we've been trying to figure a good name. And she goes, Esau. <laughs> oh, well, isn't that cute? Uh, Esau, could you, see, we don't name our kids Esau. We don't name them Cain. Why? Because they symbolize that which God rejects. I don't want that. You see, it's a firstborn life. Our firstborn condition cannot please God, no matter how sincere we are in saying, God, but I want to do, I want to live righteously for you. He says, you want to live righteously, you need to give up your firstborn life. You need to turn and repent of it and believe upon Jesus the second and be clothed in his righteousness. That's the secret to partaking of righteousness is actually recognizing that Adam doesn't have any. And we are in Adam. We need to put off the old man with his deeds. And we need to believe in Jesus and put on the new man. So look at this list. These are second men. So you're going to notice I'm going to put the first man on the left, make it small and diddly squat, and then show you the second man. Adam, Jesus. Of course, that's the big one, right? Cain, Abel. God selects the second. It's the second one that pleases him. Ishmael, Isaac. Isaac is the man of promise. Ishmael is Abraham's attempt in his own strength to fulfill a promise of God. And God's like, that can't stand before me. Ishmael's a wild donkey of a man. Esau, and then we have Jacob, who is also known as Israel. Saul, first king. David, second king of Israel. Isn't that amazing? A man after God's own heart. Amalek, first nation. Israel, second nation. Haman, Mordecai. Haman has that position of second, and then he's going to be ousted as the first, and then Mordecai is going to replace him. We see this pattern all throughout Scripture, that the first is rejected. You know that Haman is an Agagite? You know, an Agagite, the king of the Agagite, well, the king of the Amalekites, remember that Saul was supposed to kill all the Amalekites, and he kept the king, whose name was Agag, alive. And so you have this descendant of the Agagites, known as the Agagites. And who is the Agagite? Uh, Haman. He's a first. And he's anti-Jewish. <laughs> it's the best way of describing it. He wants the Jews dead. Okay, so we have a second being set in his very position, Mordecai, in the book of Esther. So let's look at some first elements. These are going to be foreshadows or shadow elements. They're firsts. They're not the seconds. So the Passover lamb is a wonderful, you're not going to criticize the Passover lamb. Just because the first doesn't mean it's negative. Like, for instance, the old covenant is a first. It doesn't mean it's evil. However, the Passover lamb is not the lamb that is going to take away the sin of the world. It is going to cleanse and cover one household. And so you're going to see a greater Passover lamb in the future. The law, the law is a first teacher. That's actually what it is. It's an instructor. It's a teacher. And that first law is not sufficient to lead you into the presence of God. And so it's going to tell you what is righteousness, but it cannot give you that righteousness in and of itself. The serpent on the pole, that is a foreshadow. It's a lesser picture, but it is a picture of Jesus 
hanging on a cross. The rock, the manna, Joshua himself, the Jordan River, the land of promise. Let's look at how that contrasts. The, the, the second elements are on the right. So the Passover lamb, is Jesus the lamb slain. He even is going to die on Passover. I mean, everything about this, he's the capital L lamb. All those other lambs were little lowercase l lambs. But now we have the lamb of God. The law is the first teacher. It was given on a day, a very specific day in history called Pentecost. Now we have a greater Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and what is given? A greater teacher, a greater instructor, one that can actually give you salvation, bring you to the salvation of Christ, as opposed to just tell you that you need salvation. The law is a great teacher, but it leads you to Christ, is what it does. A serpent on the pole, Jesus on the cross. The rock that is struck and out comes water. Jesus is going to be struck and out comes living water. Jesus pierced. Manna, and then Jesus in the New Testament. Unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood. Remember that, John 6? Jesus is real food. Joshua, same name as Jesus. And Joshua, if I were to choose, give you the choice, like which one do you want to lead you? Joshua in the Old Testament or Jesus in the New? Of course we want Jesus. We want the Son of God. He's the greater picture. The Jordan River, the baptism of the Spirit. The land of promise in Christ by faith. We have been brought into Christ by faith and what is opened up to us are the exceeding great and precious promises of God. First conditions. This is where we are in Adam. So I'm going to move Adam over here. See that? I'm in Adam right here. This is not where I want to hang out, guys. Over here, I'm in Jesus, okay? You're always going to notice I'm going to sit, stick the bad stuff over on this side of the, of the stage, and the good stuff is over here. It's, I mean, not that far apart, right? But over here, if we're in Adam, we have certain conditions in this first state. We are under law, we are controlled by sin, we are ruled by the flesh, and we are spiritually dead. However, second conditions totally transform. When we repent and we believe in Jesus, no longer are we under law, we're now under something different, which I'm going to explain for those of you that are going to go through Ellerslie, we'll go into this at a great level. We are under grace. We're no longer a sinner, we're actually now called the righteousness of God. And the flesh no longer rules, but the Spirit of God is in command, and He rules. And then we are no longer spiritually dead, we are spiritually alive. So Paul the Apostle in Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, instead of in Adam. There is no longer a condemnation that weighs down upon us, because we are now in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So I was under the law of, uh, of you sin, you die, of sin and death, but now I'm under a higher law called the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. For what the law, this law, could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. First numbers, 40. 40 is the first number. You're gonna see it all over the place in the Bible. There's 40, and what does it do? It proves weakness. It proves that man cannot do it. I mean, you can give all sorts of illustrations with this, but let's, let's even look at Saul, who is being uh, berated by Goliath for how many days? 40 days. And what's going to happen after 40 days are completed? On the 41st day, who shows up? A second. His name is David. It was on the 41st day that he took on Goliath. Isn't that interesting? 40 is a number of completion, but what is it completing? What is it showing? The weakness of something, that that in and of itself is insufficient. So Moses is going to be on the backside of the wilderness for how many years? 40. You know that after 40 years are completed on the first day of the 41st year, he runs into a burning, burning bush? And then they're going to be tried in the wilderness for how many years? 40. 
You know when Joshua takes command and leads them across the Jordan River and it parts on dry land, they walk across to take on Jericho? You know what day that is? The first day of the 41st year. That's pretty amazing, guys. In other words, what you see is 40 is bringing something to completion so that the new beginning can start in our life. We need to allow God to bring us to the end of that 40 where we lose confidence in ourselves. It's no longer us who can save. I can't do this. Moses thought he could save his people, but he has to go through a 40 to recognize, God, I can't do it. And even when God, on the first day of the 41st year, says, hey, you're my guy now at the burning bush, he's like, I, I can't do this. You see, now he's ready because he doesn't believe he's the savior. He knows that God has to do it. So second numbers, 40 years in one day and 41. And so you're going to see Jesus tried for 40 days. Why? It's a symbol. It's a parallel. And then on the 41st day, what he's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and enters into his ministry in the land of promise. He's in the wilderness. And then on the 41st day, he enters into his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit in the land of promise. All right. Does that sound like a parallel or what? Yeah, because that was a shadow in the Old Testament of that which is being fulfilled in Jesus. Luke 4, now when the devil had ended every temptation, this is the, the 40, 40th day, he departed from him until an opportune time. Then Jesus, on the 41st, returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding regions. So the ministry of Christ is going to bust forth on the 41st day. So here we are, January 1405 B.C., a long time ago. At the plains of Moab, staring across into the land of promise. So remember, we're, we're talking about the book of Deuteronomy. And Moses is going to begin his speech, which then he is going to write down, which is going to become the book of Deuteronomy, and Joshua is going to put the finishing touches on it, which is only appropriate because that's how the Bible works too. Jesus is going to put the finishing touches on uh, the whole thing. He's not just going to leave it with the Old Testament, with what Moses had to say, but uh, he's going to put his two cents in at the end. Deuteronomy 1, 1 through 8. These are the words, so I'm just going to read this through for the first eight verses, so you can just get familiar with the terrain. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness. In the Arabah, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Dezahab. It is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea, which is where they were. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, so just to give you an idea, we're in the 40th year, which means it's 39 years and 11 months in. So when it says in the Jewish mind that you're in the 40th year, that means you're chewing on the 40th year. So you are making your way through the 40th year. When, when we celebrate like a 40th birthday, we think we are now 40, when actually we've been 39 plus something the whole time chewing on that 40th. When you turn 40, you've actually completed 40 years. So this is the 39th year. So in the 40th year means you're, in the, you're actually 39 plus 11 months and in the first day of that 11th month. Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had commanded him to give them. After he had defeated Sion, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth and Edri. Across the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound this law, saying, The Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb, saying, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. And this is God continuing to speak to them what he said at Horeb. Turn and set your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all their neighbors in the Arabah, in the hill country and in the low land and in the Negev and by the sea coast, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have placed the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to them and their descendants after them. All right, now, many of us are familiar with that sort of thing. It just sounds like the Pentateuch, the first five books. I mean, we sort of hear these things a lot, that we begin to dull over and recognize that that is a shadow of something. So something is taking place here. Now, that's already been said in the Bible. Why do we need to repeat it? This is a second repetition. This is a rehearsing in the ears of a second generation. 
something very specific. The first generation is going to die in the wilderness because of unbelief. But God is going to start by going all the way back and saying, this is your land to take. So it's a second invite to a second generation to cross a second water obstacle into a second territory in order to live a second life under a second leader. I mean, I'm seeing a few twos in that. So this is a pattern that we see and it's unfurling in this very book and it is setting the stage not so that we can just marvel at you know, history, but so that we can actually actively engage in this same movement that you're going to see Moses commission this second generation to do. This is, this is us. You might as well put yourself in the story. This is us. You have spent long enough at this mountain. You've stayed long enough in the wilderness. It's time to pack up our things and we're going to go in and take what God has given us. Uh -huh. You're starting to get stirred up. I mean, this is why I'm excited about this. This is the rise of the shadow kingdom. This is the rise of what God desires to do in us. So Deuteronomy 1.4, Moses spoke to the children of Israel after he had defeated Sihon and Og. So if you don't know who Sihon is, that means very little. If you don't know who Og is. Now, some of us know who Og is because it's so intriguing to the, to the mind. I don't know if it's just a guy thing. When you hear about Og's bedstead that was like 18 feet, and you're like, oh, that is cool. And so you remember Og. Og has a tendency to stay in there. But you need to recognize to the Israelites, this is a big statement. Okay, they understand something huge has been accomplished. It has demonstrated the power of God before a people. And so Moses spoke to the children of Israel after he had defeated Sion and Og. Something great is going to take place, and then Moses is going to speak. A stage has been set. And so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and forth with some of these into the New Testament so you can see the parallels. And I'm going to use Romans 5 through 6 to show you the parallels with the same pattern of communication that Moses is using here. Deuteronomy 1.6. So these are just the scriptures I'm going I'm to take out. I'm going to take out this one about it's a certain time, something is going to happen, and then Moses is going to appeal to them. And then in Deuteronomy 1.6, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Okay, so that's, now I'm going to take this statement from Deuteronomy, which is just sort of a statement Moses made to some people uh, hanging out in a wilderness, and I want you to be moved by it. Because you've stayed long enough where you're at, too. And it's high time that we progress. Deuteronomy 1, 8, I'm guessing. I don't know. I, for some reason, I don't have the actual scripture here. This is Sandy. You didn't uh, edit my, my thing. She's like, you didn't send it to me. Turn and set your journey. Isn't that an amazing statement? Turn and set your journey. See, I have placed the land before you. Go in and possess the land. So the shadow scriptures, those are the ones I want to build on. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So I want us to recognize that this Deuteronomic passage in Deuteronomy 1, 1 through 8, is given by inspiration of God. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's an amazing thought. That means this is God's very word. His Holy Spirit was speaking through Moses to articulate in a very specific way. It still hosts Moses' personality, his writing style, his, his expressions, which is you're going to see it, all different writers. There's over 40 writers in the Bible, and they all have a unique personality and a different writing style, and God doesn't overrule that. He uses it. However, it's still God's word that is coming through Moses. So all Scripture, including Deuteronomy 1, 1 through 8, is given by inspiration of God, and get this, is profitable for doctrine. If you were to look at it as doctrine being the pattern of how you are to live in honoring Christ. How does it work? How are you supposed to exercise this reality in your life? So, Deuteronomy 1, 1 through 8 is actually profitable for you to do that. Isn't that just a weird thought? All scripture is not only God-breathed, but it's 
profitable so that you can activate and live out the life of Christ. It's also uh, profitable for reproof. It can correct us. You're staying at the mountain, and then you hear this. It's high time that you uh, depart from that mountain. You've stayed here long enough. And it actually can reprove you. Isn't that an amazing thought that Deuteronomy 1, 1 through 8 could actually reprove our soul and correct us onto a healthy pattern. And it's also profitable for correction and instruction in righteousness. There's a right way to live out your life that models Christ, that showcases his nature. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we're just simply applying that logic to Deuteronomy 1, 1 through 8. So the shadow actions, remember Sion and Og have fallen. So if I was talking to you, that doesn't mean a lot because you don't know, like I said, who Sion and Og is. Now you have at least this idea that Og had a huge bed, but that might be all you know, right? These are formidable characters that it would take a supernatural work of grace to tear down. And the same is true in your life. There are certain things in your life that you have trembled before for years and you have allowed to intimidate you. But God just wants to freshly remind you this morning that Sion and Og have fallen. Hey guys, I know we're headed into difficult territory here and they have a whole bunch of giants, a whole bunch of walled cities. It's 31 hostile empires. But do you remember what God has done? Do you recognize that he has brought down the giants? This is the God we serve. He's a giant slayer. Remember that as you go into reasoning these next steps forward. Rehearse it in your soul. Oh, sorry. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right. Remember Sion and Og have fallen. Here's the next one. You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and set your journey. Possess the land. So this is right at the beginning. This is setting the stage for the book of Deuteronomy. So remember Sion and Og have fallen. What is that parallel for us? Is there something we should remember that would give us confidence and strength to move forward with boldness? Well, I would say so. I would say there's a whole bunch we could meditate upon. I'm just going to parallel this with the flow of Paul's argument in Romans 5 and 6. So Romans 5, 6 through 9. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So what do you see Paul doing? Sion and Og have fallen. The power of sin and death, the control of the flesh over your life is defeated. And then he's going to say, step forward. He's going to, in the, in the, in the, the, the words in, in, Psalm, in Psalm, in Romans 6, is a movement, it's an action chapter, where he's going to say, because of this, here's what you do. If it's true that God is before you and behind you and he is going to take this land, here's how you animate that faith. So you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Now look at Romans 6, 1 through 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Should we stay at this mountain? Should we continue in the habits of our forefathers, the first generation? Should we continue in unbelief and say, oh, God can't do this? Should we stay here? God forbid. Certainly not. Let's move forward. We do not reason as first generation anymore. We reason as a second generation. God is rehearsing it to us again. The same promises that he gave to us before, he is now reminding us of them again, saying let's leave this mountain, let's leave this old lifestyle, and let's progress forward. Romans 6, 6 through 9, turn and set your journey. So here's our This concept of turn and set your journey. Of course, if you understand the word repentance, you're going to see shades and shadows of that just in the the concept of turn and set your journey. It's it's a beautiful statement. Listen to how Paul is going to say it here. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with and that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. 
Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. If it is true that I am no longer in Adam, if it is true that I am in Christ, then I am going to leave this behind. I am not, I'm, that's why in another passage he's going to say, put off the old man and his deeds. Remove it from you. You do not need to keep that stink on you. Turn and set your journey. And then finally, possess the land. Romans 6, 10 through 11. The death that he died, he died to once, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is reckon, which I'm gonna go through this week for those of you that are present uh, in the training. I'm gonna go through it at a great level because it's an extremely important action of the soul. The term that Moses is gonna use in the Old Testament is possess the land. Well, that could be like reckon the land yours, which is an accounting term. Stick it in your account. That belongs to you. In other words, by faith, you need to take something. And as a result, you're going to see an action being required of the Christians in Romans 6, the same way there was an action required in the Old Testament. You could believe that God is strong enough to take that land, but if you don't start moving your feet and walk into the Jordan River and let it part, carry that Ark of Covenant before you and start marching around the walls of Jericho, you're never going to see it in reality. You need to animate and activate what you know to be true. Reckon it. Possess the land. So guys, Sion and Og have fallen. You have stayed at this mountain long enough. Turn and set your journey and go in and possess the land. We have a job to do, and it's not to sit in the wilderness and moan about how hot it is. It's to actually rise up in faith, knowing that God has commissioned us and called us, and if God has called us, Oh, he will go before us and behind us, and he will make a way. From shadow to glorious light. So the Old Testament, shadow. New Testament, glorious light. You can see it's no longer in shadow form. Remember, Jesus is giving parables. He's still in that final twilight period where he's, the, the Son of God has come, but he's still in the shadow where he's giving pictures of what's to come, and then boom, he breaks through. He crushes the head of Sion and Og. He actually parts the Jordan River and says, come follow me, and he leads captivity captive. Paul the Apostle, 2 Corinthians 3.11, for if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. So there are certain things that are passing away. I don't know about you, but we're not worshiping in Jerusalem. We, we're, we don't have the requirements of sacrifice and uh, ritual cleansing. There are certain things that have passed away. But those things are actually glorious. Why? Because they were shadows of a greater glory. But if those things that are glorious are passing away, what remains is even more so. What remains is the real point of it all, Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. So there seems to be a clouding, a veil, something that hinders the clarity. They don't see Jesus. So to the Jews, as long as they focus and they stay at that mountain, they remain in the wilderness. And Though God is able to deliver them and though God has supplied them everything that they need, they are functioning as a first generation. The veil is taken away. That cloud of shadow is taken away where you can actually see when you believe in Jesus. Jesus is this key that unlocks the mystery. 
And so as a result, even though we may be far more unlearned than a Jewish rabbi in the scriptures of the Old Testament, it's funny because we just take this simple key of Jesus and we come into the text that they are so mystified over. Like, what could this mean? And we're like, well, that's talking about Jesus on the cross, sir. And they're like, what What are you talking about? You see, we can go to Isaiah 53 and turn it, and we're like, oh yeah, that's talking about Jesus. Yeah, sure. Psalm 2, oh yeah, that, that's Jesus enthroned. Oh, yeah, Psalm 22, that's Jesus being pierced. Yeah, they're, they're surrounding him at the cross, and they're mocking and ridiculing him. Yeah, that's Jesus. It says they parted his clothes, or they cast lots for his clothing, and they pierced his hands and feet. Yeah, that's Jesus. We see it. Why? Because we're holding the key. You don't need to be brilliant. You need Jesus. And when you have Jesus, it unlocks the mystery so that the shadow reveals the light. 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Sion and Og have fallen. Everything that is needed to clear the way for you to move forward as a second generation, to cross the Jordan River, into a land of promise, a land flown with milk and honey, to see all your enemies defeated. And I'm not just talking about you know, some liberal band of media workers and politicians out there. I'm talking about first, here. The different things that have plagued your soul, anxieties, fretting, forebodings, fear, lust, sensuality, pride, greed. All of these hostile empires. God's saying, you wanna take them down? You see, he has defeated him. He's going before you. He's the one that does the work. What you need to do is follow. What you need to do is leave your mountain that is familiar. Leave your sin, I know it sounds funny, that is familiar. Why would you want to hang out with it? But we do it all the time. We hang out with that which is known instead of moving into the territory that is unknown because we just happen to prefer that which is known even though it's killing us. But you must turn and set your journey. You must go in and possess the land. Take what God has set before you. Father, here we are. Lord, give us the grace we need to obey, the grace we need to say yes, the grace we need to turn and to set our journey, the grace we need to possess. Lord, remind us afresh. May we see it, may we behold it, that our enemy, the devil, sin, the flesh, death itself, have been defeated. That you did not remain in the grave, but that you busted forth out of it and you brought us with you. And that you have conquered death and the grave. And that you, Lord Jesus, are the victor. May we remember who it is that we serve today. And may our confidence rise. May our strength increase. May we be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We ask these things in the name of Jesus.